started uh, learning on how to pray effectively. How to pray effectively. When we are teaching couples, we teach on how to communicate effectively. So that that which you are communicating or that which you intend to communicate is received by the receiver. That the sender's message is received and understood by the receiver. And it's good because prayer is communicating with God and it's good for us to also learn how to communicate effectively with our Father that that which we desire and intent in our hearts is received by God and we know that when God receives our prayers, he always answers them. There's no prayer that you can lift before God and God refuses to answer it. But we have this frustration. We have this frustration that we always pray and we don't seem to be getting answers. We are frustrated because I've been praying about this thing for so long and I don't seem to be getting answers. And therefore we are taking time to look at how to pray effectively. And to pray effectively entails to pray with understanding. So last Friday we looked at the fact that before you even pray, you need to understand that God loves you with his great love. So you are not trying to impress God or you are not trying to make God to love you. You are praying because you know God loves you and he has demonstrated his love by sending Christ to die on the cross for us and pay for our sins. And then not only that, he has proven his love to us by putting his spirit in us who sheds his love abroad in our hearts and therefore we understand that no one is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. We read from Ephesians chapter 3, let's just read there briefly from verse 17 throughout verse 21. I'll just read and not explain it. The Bible says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Uh, verse 20, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. That's where we centered our teaching last uh, Friday, that we need to understand the height of the love of God and the breadth of the love of God. We need to comprehend how much God loves us. And when we do like that, even when we stand before the presence of God, raising up our voices before him, giving him thanks, giving him a supplication, we do that with understanding. We are not trying to ask God. We are talking to somebody who loves us already. You know, we are not trying to convince God to love us. We are speaking to somebody who is already in love with us. And there's a difference when you speak to somebody who already loves you and when you speak to somebody whom you are trying to force or convince to love you. So last Friday, we were wallowing in the love of God just to understand that as a child of God at every time, regardless of what you are going through, God loves you. With that kind of understanding, you can start praying from that platform. I'm not approaching a God who is hesitant to minister to me. I'm approaching a God who loves me and is willing, desiring every other time just to be good to me. Praise God. So today I want us to shift gear and look at something different from the book of John chapter 14. John chapter 14, we pick it from verse number 12. I think to 14. 12 to 14. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this, he will do. Because I go to my father. Verse 13. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, 
I will do it. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's amazing. The question is, can Christ lie to us? He cannot lie to us. Have we ever prayed in the name of Jesus and it has not happened? Yes. When I reach there, I say, in the name of I've said in the name of Jesus. So is it possible that you can pray in the name of Jesus using the name of Jesus and you don't get results? Yes. So what is it that Christ is promising us here? Pay attention. What is it that Christ is promising us here? Let me give you a little background of this, what's happening in this, in this chapter. So here we have the Lord sitting down with his disciples for the last time before he goes to the cross. For the last time. We know naturally the last words of a dying man are very important. I hear people say, how could he just go without telling me anything? Not so with Christ Jesus. He didn't just go without saying anything. He talked to his disciples first before immediately Actually, if you look at the events chronologically, this was on a Thursday before he was arrested on a Friday. So Christ sits down with his disciples and he discusses with them important things. Let me just take you through quickly. In chapter 13 verse 1, it says that now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from his, this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he rose up from supper, and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and guarded himself. So you can see here, Jesus is having the last supper with his disciples. And the first thing that he wants to teach them is how to love one another. That's the first thing he wants to teach them. Then love must be one of the greatest lessons in the Bible. If when Jesus is just about to die, he chooses to teach his disciples how to love one another. And he teaches them that you can even love your enemies. How does he do it? He humbles himself because love always ministers to those that you love. If you love anybody, then you must be ready to minister to those people that you love. So he humbles himself to a level of a servant. He is the master, but he humbles himself to the level of a servant, takes a towel, guards his loins, takes a water basin, and begins to wash their feet. That was the lowest work that Christ could have given to himself. The lowest work. What used to happen in Israel, every moment you enter into someone's house, he'll call his house help to come and wash your feet. The lowest servant in the house is the one who will come and wash your feet, then you enter the house to show that you are welcome in this house. So where is Christ welcoming his disciples? Where is he welcoming? Because it's, it's a common thing that happens in Israel. But now he wants to show them that they are accepted among the beloved. They are part of his ministry on earth. They are part of his kingdom. And therefore he has to wash their feet as a sign of a welcoming them to his kingdom. Peter tried to refuse. If you go there, Peter told him, you cannot wash my feet. In verse number 8, Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now you can understand why he was washing them. It was a common culture in Israel to be washed to your feet as a sign of welcome. And therefore he was washing their feet as a sign that they are accepted in his kingdom. But again, he took a place of a servant, went to his knees as a servant. Please hear, love always serves those that you love. There's no love that makes you to become a master. Love does not make you a master. Love makes you a servant. So he washes their feet to tell them that 
although you are clean by the words I've already spoken to you, but you become dirty when walking around. So you wash their feet and not their body. When he told Peter that if I don't wash your feet, you have no place in me, Peter said, now wash my whole body. I like the emotions of Peter. So one thing has happened already. Jesus already knows that there's a man who is sitting there called Judas and he's going to betray him. But Judas is one of those people that Jesus washes their feet. In other words, love can even serve your enemies. You know, if you are a Christian and you want to have a perfect communication with God, a perfect relationship with God, remove every hatred in your heart. If Jesus will go to on his feet and wash the feet of Judas, there is nothing you cannot do for those people that you think they hate you. A Christian has no place for revenge. A Christian has no place for retaliation. A Christian has only one thing to do, to reflect Christ on earth. Listen to what I'm telling you. Praying effectively entails having a heart that is clean, that has no hatred for other people. A heart that shows love to all. As a believer in Christ Jesus, you have no place in your heart you want to harm those who hurt you. So Jesus washes the feet of Judas, the one who will betray him. Follow that so keenly. After he washes their feet, he tells them, even though I'm washing your feet, the guy who is going to betray me is here. And he tells Judas, I know what you are going to do, and therefore since the time has come, please do it quickly. If you are Judas, I don't know what you'll do that time. You want to kill a man who loves you. But a man can only give what he has. Christ has love. Judas has hatred. So Jesus will give love and allow Judas to stay with his hatred. You are a child of God. Always give what you have. Love. Praying from a perspective that you love everybody makes you pray accurately for everyone. It makes you pray accurately. You don't pray that God show him. God destroy him. Remove that business that is, is, is walking around bragging about business. No. You say, God, increase him mightily. Reveal your son to him. Because you want God to reveal himself to this person and this person to be able to come to the knowledge of truth. That's what you want. Jesus loved the world. That which Christ loved, you also love. When he was here, he dined with sinners. Love the sinners also. Pray for their salvation. Have compassion over them. That's a, a, a point where you begin from and pray effectively. And learn from him. And I'll just show you in a short while. You know, it's a joy time showing them how to love, showing them how to be humble, showing them how to serve one another, showing them that the greatest is the, is the one who serves one another. But he points out, even though I'm serving all of you, Judas, you want to betray me. I know we are betrayed every day. There's betrayal in this world every day. But the greatest gift you can give those who betray you is love. I know I'm talking about impossibilities. But I'll show you how it is possible. That's the greatest gift. Now, look at these two men. So there's Judas there. There's another one called Peter. And Jesus tells Peter, even you, Peter, I know you'll deny me. So, Jesus is sitting among twelve, two of his disciples. One is going to betray him, one will deny him. But he washes all their feet. He dines with them. He serves them bread. The guy who's going to deny you? Yes. What is the difference between Judas and Peter at that time? They are same. Denying Jesus and betraying him is the same. The same. But later, Peter is repentant. Judas is not. This is the difference. Peter is repentant. And Judas is not. Let's call them both sinners. <laughs> eh? Sinful disciples of Christ. So that you can, you can be in the loop. They are sinful disciples of Christ. But one of them has penitence in his heart. He's repentant. He's remorseful. He doesn't like what he has done. One of them doesn't care, doesn't mind. He's ruled by money. 
as long as it can be paid, anything goes. Imagine you want to speak to your family the greatest things the last day you are about to die and two of them hate you, two of them are against you. So after he has pointed out that Judas, you go and betray me. Peter, I know you'll deny me. I have no problem with you. Just go ahead and deny me. He now goes to chapter 14 where he tells them things that they didn't want to hear. So put yourself in the feet of Christ. There is betrayal and there is denial. But he still does what? Loves them. That's a mature and powerful believer. Can we begin there? Just where you are sitting, think about them. Think about those guys. They betray you. They deny you. They hate you. They talk maliciously about you. But because you are the one who carries Christ, you do what? You love them. So that when you speak, heaven opens and answers your prayer. Praying effectively. Chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 were the last words of Christ. He finished by actually praying for the disciples and praying for the church in chapter 17. So he comes to chapter 14, verse 1, and tells them, hey guys, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I will not have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Think about it. Think about it. Who is Christ to these people? He is everything. He is their helper. He is their protector. He is their provider. He is the one who loves them. He is the one who serves them. He is everything to them. And he tells them now that hour has come that I need to go away. But he tells them, hey, let not your hearts be troubled. So think about it. They are about to lose a friend. They are about to lose that guy who multiplies fish and bread for them. They are about to lose that guy who protects them. They are about to lose that guy who teaches them, the guy who gives them wisdom to live, who guides them. They are about to lose that guy who protects them and gives them everything they need, who heals them when they are sick. They are about to lose that guy who resurrects the dead among them. Their hearts were shaken. They were troubled. And yet the Lord tells says what? Let not your heart be troubled. What is troubling you as you go to into prayer? What is troubling you? Is it the cold? Is it the corona? Is it the price of unga? The price of mafuta? Eh? Is it the cost of life? The cost of life has become so bad. What is troubling you? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Is it a spouse? Let not your heart be troubled. Because you cannot pray effectively with a troubled heart. But let me walk you through something so quickly. Thomas tells him, uh, uh, Jesus, just show us the way and it will be good for us. The way to the Father. You know they are used to with him. He does things in a literal and physical sense. That's all that they understand. If they are in trouble, Christ must physically and literally get them out of that trouble. So they are saying, show us where the Father is in case we need you, we'll just come there. Jesus looks at them. He says three very important things. In verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Then he says, no one comes to the Father except through me. He's not saying that no one goes to the Father no one comes to the Father. In other words, Thomas, if you are in the way, then I'm the way. I'm the life. I'm the truth. If you come to me, you have come to the Father. And Thomas, Thomas is not so cool. Eh? But this thing affected Thomas' life so much. Because later, when Christ was resurrected, Thomas understood, ah. He understood the Christology of Christ and said, ah, this is all that you are talking about. My God and my Lord. There is no other disciple who got that revelation apart from Thomas. No other disciple that looked at Jesus and says, this is my God and my Lord at the same time. Thomas only. He kept this in his mind. He kept meditating it maybe day and night. This guy said, "Is the way, is the life, is the truth. Father, I don't understand it, but I know you can reveal this to me. Every time you feel so confused, so lost, so unsure of yourself, so frustrated, he is the way. You go to him and you know what you need to do. 
Every time you feel that things in your life are dead, your business is dying, your own health is dying, your children are dying, everything is dying, everything around you, everything is dying, your finances are dying. He is life, is the life. He says, and, and life was in Christ Jesus, and this life was the light of man. He is life. Whatever is dying in your life, he has the power to bring life. He says so in John chapter 5, verse 21. Just as the Father gives life to the dead, even so the Son also. That's the same. So his life is the way and is the truth. When you are not sure, just go to Jesus Christ. We have no time to go into that because there's something I want to talk about. So now, Philip comes and says, uh-uh. If Thomas, you have understood, me have not understood. Since you don't want to show us the way, you say you are the way, now show us the Father. Thomas is tricky. And Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me all these days and you don't know who I am. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And now since you know me, now you know who the Father is. And Philip keeps quiet. You know, when you challenge a clever man, even when he doesn't understand, he says, Amen. Because you don't want to look like a fool. That's the good thing of teaching people who are clever. They, they look at you as if we understand. Pastor, we understand. Even when they don't. That's, that's great. That's, 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 that's good. So Philip says, that's, that's nice. I get it. But Jesus knows this guy has not got it. At all, at all. Not got it. Then now we go to verse 12, where we read. So let's go to verse 12. That's where I'm rushing to. Verse 12, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than this, he will do because I go to my Father. Now look at what Christ is saying now. He's saying, if you believe in me, so we are, we are looking at praying effectively. If you believe in me, the works that I do, you also will do them. And because I go to the Father, you will even do greater works. The question is, what is it that you will do that Christ has never done? He's the creator. He has raised the dead. If you look in the Gospels, I think there are three instances where Christ raised the dead. I think so. He raised a girl, then another boy, then Lazarus. There's a boy he met with the mother. The mother, mother was going to bury him. He raised him. And a girl was dead at home, and then Lazarus. He raised them. So let's look at that as an example. So Christ raised three people in his entire earthly ministry. So if Jesus was telling his disciples that greater works means you will raise more people, if you put Paul and Peter and all the disciples together, they only raised two people. Paul raised Eutychus because he has refused to learn. And Paul's ministry is to teach. And Eutychus is dying. They told Eutychus, you must wake up, learn. If you want to die, you can die later. Peter raised Tabitha, I think. And that was just that. So if it meant that you people will be raising more people, then whatever Christ promised did not happen. The meaning of greater works that you will do is the extent and intensity of the work that you'll do. Jesus was in a small place, small place in Israel. You know, <laughs> from border to border in Israel, I think by flight, it doesn't even reach one hour from border to border. Israel is a very tiny, small nation. It's a 0 0.005 of the world. Tiny little place. And that's where Jesus was. What Christ is saying, that I have only been able to reach people in this small area. But if you believe in me, my Father will give you what it takes to reach people far and wide. You will reach much more uh, people than I've ever done. You will go farther than I've ever gone. And it's possible, even me right now here, I have more disciples here than Christ Jesus. They were 12. We are more than 12 today. Yeah, so I'm doing greater works than Christ. It did mean that you, you will do miracles that Christ has never done. No. 
Because which miracle is that that you will do that Christ didn't do? It meant that you, a believer in Christ Jesus, you will do much more extensively and intensively than what Christ has ever done. So if you are here and you're not doing greater works than Christ, if you're not preaching to more than 12 people, reaching out to the world, spreading the gospel beyond the boundaries of Kenya, then you are letting Christ down. Amen? Greater works, the extent of what God can do through you, you have not started experiencing it. And maybe from today you'll experience it. Because that's where I'm walking you to. So he says, most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, I know we all believe in Christ Jesus. Amen. The works that I do, you will do also. So you need to ask yourself, what works were Christ doing? And it may include the miraculous signs and wonders. It may include that. It may include healing the sick, raising the dead. It may include praying for things to happen in a miraculous way. It may include that. But what Christ was talking about was the extent. And then he says, this will happen because he has, he has gone to the Father. You see, he has brought the Father in the loop. And verse 13 says, and whatever you ask in my name, in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now, our religious upbringing, we know that in the name of Jesus, we say it at the end of the prayer. Which is very good. Which is very good. The question is, what does Christ mean by whatsoever you ask in my name? If we get that, we'll have unlocked something very important in our lives. Are you ready? I want you to assume that you are a, a salesman for an insurance company. So when you go to somebody, what, what do you want to insure? Let's assume you want to insure what a car. And you explain to somebody what the insurance will do. Are you telling that person what you will do? What are you telling that person? So your confidence is in yourself? Your confidence is in there? The company. When someone comes to you and says, my car has been stolen, do you run away? Do you get afraid? Is it you who replaces the car? It's the insurance company. So you remain with the same confidence when you are promising in a time of trouble because it's not about you, it's about the insurance company. Now what I want you to understand, when Jesus says, whatever you ask for in my name, it means whatever you ask for consistent with my name, with my character, consistent with my authority, consistent with my word, consistent with my promises, consistent with my love, my grace, my mercy, that I will do it. So when you pray in the name of Jesus, it's just not mentioning a name. It's mentioning a name saying like this, I have the power of attorney to represent Christ Jesus here on earth. I may look a weakling. I may have limitation. I may not know how to speak properly. I may not have the strength to do some things. I don't look like I can do what I'm saying, but I am not the one going to do it. I am an agent. There is someone who has sent me, and I'm his agent, and he says, if you are sick, you will be healed today. That's how you pray because you are being sent by Christ to do that and it does not depend on you. Don't look at yourself. Don't exercise and say now we want to go and pray for the sick. It's not about you. It's because you don't know that you are an agent of Christ Jesus. If you are an agent of Christ Jesus, you can whisper a prayer. You don't have to shout. You can whisper. You can say, sister, the Lord has done it for you. And that's sufficient. That is sufficient because you know you are just a representative. If you ask anything in my name, you ask consistent with the will of God, with the promises of God, with the word of God, with the character of God. What do you know about Jesus Christ? What is your profession about him? If you know him as an, an almighty God, then you are praying 
prayer consistent with the power of Christ, you know there's nothing impossible with him. So you're not praying doubting. You're not praying a trying out. Maybe it will happen, maybe it will not happen. It's not trial and error. You have someone who has sent you. And how do you know that that person means business is because you have read his promises, you have read his word, you know this is his will. So you're not just shouting, in the name of Jesus, no. In your prayer, you may not even mention the name of Jesus because in you, you are praying consistent with the name of Jesus. You know he's powerful, you know he is love, you know he's gracious, you know he is kind, you know his will. So you are praying consistent with the name of Jesus Christ. I wish we could unlock this. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, it says, if, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Verse 18 says that all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus. Then verse 19 says that is that God was in Christ Jesus at the cross reconciling the world to himself. So if you are praying concerning the nature of Christ, you know that I'm already reconciled to Christ. I'm not seeking reconciliation. There's no enmity. There's no war between me and God. We have love between us. Therefore, I'm praying consistent with this. Me and God are in love. Then in verse 20 says, Therefore, since you are a new creation, reconciled back to God, you have a message of reconciliation, therefore, you are now ambassadors of Christ. Look at it. You are an ambassador of Christ. So you confront every situation as an ambassador. An ambassador can only speak on behalf of his country. Not on your own behalf. You have nothing to say. You say whatever your country has sent you to say. And while we are on this earth here, we must learn our language so that we speak that language which our country, our kingdom has sent us to speak on this earth. Praise God. That's how we confront every situation. So, this is the secret here. Whatsoever that God wants to do on earth, right from the first day, Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, to the last day, God has already prepared it and the agent of execution is Christ Jesus. It is Jesus who has the authority to release it on earth. God has prepared whatsoever he wanted to do on earth is in the hands of Christ. And it's Christ who releases it on earth. It's Christ who translates it from spiritual to the natural, to the physical, from heaven to earth. That's why Ephesians says, Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. It is in the hands of Christ. God is not doing anything new. Every blessing that is for you, you don't attract it by prayer. No, you confirm to God that I know this is mine by prayer. The best example is the young prodigal son who said, Daddy, I need a meeting with you. I have read in the word that part of this property is mine, but I don't believe it. If it's mine, give it to me now. That was a good prayer. The things of being told that this belongs to you, or healing is yours, or prosperity is yours, or you will walk in uh, joy and peace. We don't want to hear it from other people. If it is ours, then God, give us. Give us. The young man was right to ask for what belongs to him. What he did wrong was now when he received it, he left home to go in a faraway country. But to ask for what belongs to you from the father is your right. That's why you have the right to call him father. You are sons and sons have rights. When you go to God, there are rights you have as a son. You can say, God, that which is written in the word that is mine, I refuse it to remain in that word. I want it in my hand. I want it in my pocket. In Jesus' name. So, if you are an ambassador of Christ, the first thing you need to know who this Christ is. Because you cannot represent somebody you don't know. And the shortcut is just to know that his nature is all-powerful. He's loving. He's sovereign. He's gracious. He's merciful. He is kind. He is eternal. There's no time in, in, in whatever generation that Christ is not there. So you are learning who this Christ is. He's righteous. You are learning who he is. 
so that you can represent him properly. For you to represent somebody, even just a friend, you must first of all know him. Then when you know him, you know what he can do in that situation. There's a joke that is made about a man called Albert Einstein. So Albert had a driver, and this guy had driven him for so long, so long. Albert was not feeling well, so the driver told Albert, if you're not feeling well, and you go to a place that you, need, you are needed to speak, I can speak on your behalf. And Albert was like, my driver, to speak on behalf of a philosopher? The driver tells said, say, give me a chance. But the driver has been listening to Albert for years and years and years. He has understood everything he tells people. So they go in this meeting, and uh, the driver dresses like Albert and goes in front, and Albert is in the crowd, uh, dressed like the driver. And the driver gives a speech, and Albert claps, says, wow. And he's asked a few questions he answers. Then he was asked a very difficult question. So he smiled. He says, a man like you asking this kind of question, even my driver can answer you that one. And he called Albert to come and answer that question. Because Albert was the one dressed like a driver that day. But you see, for you to speak on behalf of somebody, you must understand the heart of that person. So what is the heart of Christ in that situation? Are you praying consistent with his will? Because you may be praying for, against his will. So what is the heart of Christ in that situation? You need to understand the mind of Christ. And the Bible says <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16 that we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is the word of Christ in us. You have taken time to learn his word, to meditate upon it, to, to listen to him by the power of the Holy Spirit, and now you understand the will of God. That's why John can say in 1 John chapter 5 at verse 14, this is the confidence that we have, that if we pray in accordance to his will, he hears us. So what is his will? We know the will of God is that everybody gets born again. So are you born again? Yes, that's the will of God. So when you pray as a child of God, you are praying in the will of God. We know the will of God. The will of God is that rejoice in everything give thanks for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Look at it in uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We know the will of God. So we can pray consistent with the will of God. Let's pick it from verse 16. The Bible says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So that's the will of God. You're not praying, complaining, murmuring, anger. You're not praying because you're frustrated, because you're doubting. You're praying because you are rejoicing in Christ Jesus, because you are giving thanks always, because you are praying without ceasing, because this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So if someone asks what is the will of God for you, is to give thanks always, to pray without ceasing, to rejoice always. That's the will of God for you through Christ Jesus. Let me show you another will of God. Just one more, then we move from that. You can go in the Bible and research and find what the will of God. Chapter 4, just go a chapter behind. Chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality. That's the will of God. God wants a sanctified vessel. A cleansed vessel. So when you stand before God, you're not going before God a filthy, dirty, stinking vessel. You are sanctified. You are a sanctified vessel. You are set apart from sin. You are set apart from the world. You are set apart from the devil's activities. You are for Christ. In your heart. Do you want your prayers answered? You pray in the will of God. And that is praying consistent with the name of Christ. When Jesus says, in my name, he says, in my will in my plan, in my purpose, according to my word, according to my character, according to my nature, pray like that. You can go throughout the Bible and see what is the will of God. You'll see the will of God, the will of God. This is the will of God. But our sanctification, staying away from sin, that's why uh, Paul can say, men should lift up holy hands before God. Praise Jesus. Do you want to pray effectively? Pray consistent with the name of Jesus Christ. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. It says, nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ, what does the Bible say? That is when you want to pray, that you want to pray in the will of God. This is the will of God. Depart from iniquity. Look at verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Are you seeing that in your Bibles? Then it says here, flee from youthful lusts. So sanctification of our vessel. So that when a vessel stands before God, it's a vessel of honor. That is praying in the name of Jesus. Praying consistent with the nature of Christ, with the will of Christ, with the promises of Christ, with the, with, with, consistent with the word of Christ. That's praying in the name of Jesus. Praying in the name of Jesus is just not mentioning his name. Praying consistent with the name of Jesus is praying with understanding of who Jesus is. Philippians chapter 2. You rather pray one word that is answered by God than many words that will not receive answers. Effective prayer. If you listen to me, your prayer life will change. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that at the name of Jesus every name should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth. Now look at verse 11. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now my question is, what is the name of Jesus there? The Bible says God has given Jesus Christ a name above all names. So that name cannot be Jesus Christ. The Lord. The Lord. So when you say, in the name of the Lord, what are you saying? He is master. He is master. Even over you and over every situation. Didn't you hear his disciples say, which manner of man is this? That even the winds, nature can obey him. Peter looked upon Christ Jesus and what happened when they, they have been fishing the whole night, expert fishermen, they have been fishing the whole night and they didn't get fish. But when they listened to the voice of Christ Jesus, all the fish were called upon to go in the net. Because his master, when you call him Lord, that is his name. Because the Bible says, God has given Jesus Christ a name above all names. So the name cannot be Jesus Christ. The name is at the mention of the name, Lord then every knee must bow. We don't force them. Praying consistent with the name of Jesus Christ, you don't force anything to happen. The moment you pray consistent that name and mentioning that name, then whatsoever is arising against you must bow. The word of God is true. So the name of Jesus is the Lord. And the moment you call him the Lord, you are agreeing that he's the master he has sovereign rule over everything. You are not saying that this one I can handle it and this one Christ can handle. He has sovereign rule over even the smallest aspects of your life. In your heart, that's what you believe. As you go to prayer, you know he is Lord. He has sovereign rule. He is the master. Whenever I represent him, because I'm just an ambassador, whenever I say his name, that is the one who sent me, then everything must bow. Try approaching situations in the name of Jesus. The Lord. In your heart, you know he is the Lord. He is the one who has sent me. I'm just an ambassador. I am approaching this situation because in his word, I have proved that this is the way he wants this situation to be. You are approaching this situation because you are a sanctified vessel set apart for God's use. You are approaching that situation because you know the nature and the power of Christ Jesus. You are approaching that situation because you know the promises of Christ concerning that situation. It's not you. You are just an ambassador. Praise God. Look at what it says in uh, Proverbs 18. Someone can read Proverbs 18 verse 10. The name of the Lord. The name is, of the Lord. 
is a strong tower. It's a strong tower. What happens to it? The righteous no, run no, no, to no, it. No. The righteous. Who are the righteous? Those who have believed in Christ Jesus have the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. So you are the ones that God is saying, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous do what? Run to it. And what happens to them? And are saved. They are saved. It does not matter what is chasing you. It doesn't matter. Believe that word. Go to Psalms chapter 18 and verse 2. Believe that word that the name of the Lord is a strong tower and when the righteous run to it, you are saved safe and secure. Because you are, you are running to that name. And how do you run to the name of Jesus? In prayer. Psalms chapter 18 verse 2. Uh -huh. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is? My rock. My rock. Uh -huh. And my fortress. And my fortress. And my deliverer. And my deliverer. My God, my strength. My God, my strength. In whom I trust. In whom I trust. My shield my shield and the own of my salvation and the and the own of my salvation yeah and my stronghold and my stronghold this of it was all this of is your refuge is your refuge haven't you ever wondered why james can say with confidence submit yourself to god eh? and the devil as simple as that you submit to god eh? Not only by saying the name of Jesus. There are so many people who say the name of Jesus when they don't know who that Jesus is. They are not praying consistent to the name of Jesus. They are not praying in the name of Jesus. Mentioning the name of Jesus is not praying in the name of Jesus. For you to pray in the name of Jesus, you must understand things like Psalms, chapter 18, verse 2. Things like Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 10. You need to understand things like uh, Philippians, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 and 11, that God has given him a name that is above all names. That by the mention of his name, every knee must bow and every tongue must profess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's where it all ends, to the glory of God the Father. So let's go back to John 14 and finish our... Uh, just a challenge here. When Jesus says that most assuredly I say to you, verse 12, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do, and greater works than this he will do, because I go to the Father. Let me just show you how the Bible solves the Bible problems. Go to same same John the, in chapter 13, verse 16. Most assuredly, uh -huh. I say to you, mm -hmm. a servant is not greater than his master, uh -huh. nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Let's solve this problem. If Jesus is telling his disciples that you will do greater works than I've done, so if I have raised one person, you'll raise ten, if I've opened two eyes, we'll open 500 eyes. If that's what Christ is saying, look at what he's telling them. A servant is not greater than... So what is it? Go to Matthew. Matthew says it's better. Matthew chapter 10 verse 24. Matthew 10 verse mm -hmm. 24. Mm -hmm. A disciple is not above his teacher. A disciple is not above? His teacher. Uh -huh. Nor a servant above his master. Uh -huh. It's enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher uh -huh. and a servant like his master. Amen. So you understand it's not about the nature of the miracle that will be greater and more powerful than what Christ has done. It's the extent of the miracle. Because you cannot do anything greater than what Christ did. The only greater thing you can do, you can lead many people to Christ. Christ only led 120. So if you are a, a disciple of Christ, then you need to lead more than 120. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So that when you are praying consistent with the will of God, you are leading people to Christ. You are praying for the sick all over. Christ could only do it in Israel. Praise God. We need to know who Christ is. We need to have a personal relationship with him. We need to understand his will, his purpose, his promises. When you say, in the name of Jesus, then that has power now. But we say always in the name of Jesus when we have no understanding of the will of God. We have no understanding. And who is Jesus teaching this? People who are going to betray him. People who are going to deny him. And some of them who are going to run away from him and say, if you are going to the cross, you are alone. Do you know it's only one person who was at the cross? John. What is the difference between John and the other disciples? 
John never told Jesus Christ, I love you. He never told him. Because my love for Christ can be frustrated any time. Corona can frustrate my love for Christ. The price of Unga can frustrate my love for Christ. The price of petrol. It can frustrate your love for Christ. But John always said, I am the disciple who is most loved. And the Bible says nothing whatsoever can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. When you know that you are loved, you can go through any situation, however difficult it is. It's better for us to know that God loves us than to testify that we love God because our love for God always dwindles. But if your heart is assured that he loves me, that alone can take you through the most difficult situation. And at the foot of the cross, only the disciple who knew that I am loved was standing there. Peter had run away being told by a small girl. And when a small girl talks to you in Israel, small girl, he ran away. He said, I have never seen this man. I don't know him. The rest of the disciples had disappeared. But only the one who knew, I am loved. Praise be to God. In the name of Jesus, you can ask for anything anything, anything. And he says, I'll do to you. Lastly, I want you to understand like this. In chapter 14, which is where we are, lastly, I want you to understand verse 13 and 14 says, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Sometimes we pray for selfish purposes. God, make me a good teacher of your word that people may know me. Is, is God being glorified in that? No. So whenever you are praying, make sure the intent of your heart, the motivation for the prayer is to glorify God. Have you ever wanted money just for, to do ministry so that the uh, gospel will not suffer loss, so that uh, you know the church will not have challenges when you are asking for money from God? for the glory of God. Even to take care of your family to the glory of God. You see, if you are praying for a financial breakthrough, pray, but make sure the motivation of your heart, not the words of your lips. Make sure that your lips is connected to your heart. The motivation of your heart is that God may be glorified. You don't want to do miracles so that you may become a powerful, mighty man of God. No. You want to do miracles that people may know that God heals, that people may know God provides, God protects. That's why you want to perform miracles. It's still possible for you, the people of God, right now, you who are here, to perform miracles, signs, and wonders. I believe so. I believe so. The Bible says, those who believe in Christ Jesus, all these miracles, signs, and wonders will do what? Follow them. Follow them. You'll not go seeking for them. You'll just be sitting somewhere and someone tells you, uh, um, yeah, we are struggling here, we want to begin a business and tell him, let's, let's pray about the business. And you pray. And God does it. God does it. In the name of Jesus, you can achieve it. Do you believe? Raise up your hand. Oh Lord my God. Dear friend, you may have watched this message and yet you are not born again. It's not an accident, but God's plan. All you need to do now is believe that Christ Jesus died on the cross and settled the penalty for all your sins. When you rely only on this finished work, you become the righteousness of God because all your sins are forgiven. You become a child of God with all the rights of a son. You'll never ever perish because you have eternal life, the very life of God. You're welcome to worship with us every Sunday from 10 a.m. We are located at Umoja Inako Estate along Moy Drive, directly opposite the Umoja 2 Chief's Office, Nairobi, Kenya.